We're live here again at Buffalo Trace Distillery for another episode of Whiskey Wednesday with none other than Bourbon Hall of Famer Freddie Johnson. Hey Freddie. Hey Tim, how you doing today? Good. Well, are we on a, a journey today? A lot of people are asking right now, how long can you age bourbon? Well, let's give you an idea of what we're doing here at Buffalo Trace. We're gonna go into a place called Warehouse P. When we get inside, Tim, we're gonna talk a little bit about what's kind of cool about Warehouse P and how is it different from other aging facilities. I like to come into this place, it's really kind of cool. It's called the last drop. Let's go inside. And Freddie, we can take your mask off if you want, or you can leave it on. We're all... Perfect. <laughs> So Tim, let's take a look around. Very few people realize there are two types of aging facilities, no matter what they're made out of. So a traditional aging facility is what we call a vertical aging warehouse, which means that the air is free to travel from the ground level all the way up to the roof like an old tobacco barn. But what you'll notice is these are only six barrels high and you've got a concrete ceiling. There are five more levels like this above us. So Warehouse P holds about 50,000 barrels, but each floor is its own separate aging chamber. So can we come around this way and we'll talk about what's so special about this location? Yeah, that was a big question of mine since we walked in was, I noticed concrete floors. So each floor, concrete, it's really kind of interesting, the construction of this. So it looks almost like a fortress. Basically, that's what it is. So during the Cold War, these warehouses were constructed. And um, they are designed, believe it or not, now 50,000 barrels, a full barrel of whiskey is 550 pounds. So that's like about 12,000 tons of whiskey on these old structures that have been around here since the uh, mid 1900s. Now the kicker is, Central Kentucky sits on a fault in the Earth's crust. So when these buildings were built, it was during the Cold War. Well, Fort Knox sits on this same fault that these old distilleries sit on. And these buildings were designed in such a manner that should a bombing take place at Fort Knox, the shock waves would come right on up the fault. Well, guess what? We're ready for it. So shock waves hit, this building is designed to withstand a, a bombing at Fort Knox. Wow. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? So in this environment, as you know, you know you've been uh, around the distillery for a wee bit, and we've been talking about aging in, other, in the other warehouses. Well, one of the things that we learned is we know that when you put whiskey into the barrel, 7% is going to be absorbed by the wood you're gonna lose up to 15% during the first two years. For a barrel, a, a bottle of bourbon that we call straight, you've lost 15% of your product, no matter where it's sitting in the warehouse. All right, so if that's the case, and you continue to lose three to 4% each year, by the time you get to a bourbon that's like 23, 25 years old, you only have five or six gallons left in the barrel. So it becomes obvious at that point you're gonna have a lot of oak, you're gonna have a lot of char, it's gonna have a woody kind of a taste profile to it. But Tim, let's think about this. What if we change the environment of this barrel? Suppose we put it into a climate that was cooler than the ambient temperature associated with weather in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Let's go check it out and let's <laughs> see what we got here. So these old barrels out here, in a traditional warehouse, quite naturally, the higher you go, the hotter it's going to get, the faster your whiskey will age. So top floors of the warehouse are like an attic in your home. Temperature can reach 130 degrees. So if I want to produce a whiskey or a bourbon real fast, 
I put it in a hot environment, warm it up, cool it down because 20 to 30 degree temperature swings here in Kentucky. So, top floors of the warehouse usually are the lower bottles in the store. You know, down the lower. The more economical brands. Um, I was corrected the other day, Tim. I was doing a tour with this lady, an elderly lady, and I said, uh, I said, yes, ma'am. I said, uh, your more economical brands are usually on the lower shelves in the store. <laughs> and she smiled at me and she said, well, Freddie, I prefer to call those modestly priced. <laughs> so your modestly priced bourbons are on the lower levels usually, but those are your high volume products. So as I'm coming down in the warehouse, I'm going up on the shelf in the store. So as we get into this area, um, these barrels are going to sit here for 10 to 20 years down here on this level. But that would be like an Eagle Rare 20, maybe. But if I wait that long, I've got a lot of loss to deal with. So what if I change it a little bit more? Now, E.H. Taylor started the climatically controlled warehouse concept back in the 1800s. So he had discovered that if I have my whiskey aging in a barrel and the temperature of my whiskey reaches 45 degrees or cooler, it goes dormant. So he produced steam heat and he would basically warm the barrels up and cool them down just like it would be during the summertime. So the whiskey never went dormant. So Buffalo Trace was the first to introduce climatically controlled warehouses. Now, what would happen, what would happen, Tim, if I created an environment that all of a sudden time and evaporation kind of like got pushed out just a little bit? So what if I took my barrel and I put it into a unit and I kept the temperature at maybe about 46 or 47 degrees. And I let the barometric pressure move the whiskey in and out of the wood. Uh, just pardon me just a minute. Uh, I might have to do something here. <laughs> and just one, you know, one technical thing we may have. I'm, this is a walk-in cooler, so it may not uh, allow for my, my live stream, but we're gonna give it a shot. So if we cut out, we'll be right back. I'm gonna go in just a few feet so everybody can see it. Just so you know, just so you know, it might just be a little bit cold in here. So, now the question is, if I've got an environment like this, you can call me frosty, how long could I keep my barrels in a warehouse like this? So, this is the cooler. It, uh, we got the capacity for about 150 barrels in here. That's what we're aging. But what we're doing is we're slowing down the aging process. So what we have here is we have barrels that have been aged the majority of their life uh, in a traditional warehouse. So some of these barrels are your, your uh, Eagle Rares. Um, we've got... Uh, some rise in here. We got some wheat in here. So the question is, when we did this, we discovered we could, we released our double eagle 20 year old that everybody thought was unbelievably good. Well, it's part of its life was in a regular warehouse, but the remaining part of its life was in here. And we slowed down that process and allowed some of those sweeter flavors that are inherent in the saps and rosins of that oak to become part of the taste profile without heat. So look at the progression here. So we have some that the majority of their life out in the warehouse, 17, 18 years. And then we move across and we see some that look like they're not quite as old. So what we're actually doing is we're saying, okay, really old barrels, how long can we leave it in here? Newer barrels, the loss rate hasn't even started to occur yet. So what if I put my barrel in here for its entire life? Well, does that mean that we have the possibility of creating a 50-year-old bourbon without a lot of oak and char 
and some of those other residuals that we that we think are inherent with an older tasting product. I think we're going to be happy with what we're about to uh, present to you, uh, but just get ready because the future is here. Very cool. Very cool. Well, hopefully that wasn't too bad on the on the live feed, but that is very very cool. So we'll come out and we'll talk a little bit about now. We'll talk a little bit about how do these pieces fit together. And also a little bit about last drop, Freddie. There's been a few questions, you know, what is last drop? And we'll be able to hit that on the way out maybe, or? Yeah, we can talk a little bit about that. The last drop is really pretty cool. There were these two founders, two buddies over in, the, over in Scotland and Ireland. Uh, I think they were in, over in England, around over in Europe. And uh, they enjoyed going around to older mom and pop distilleries and a lot of times they'd have a couple of barrels that were around that um, basically had been sitting there for a number of years and uh, they would find these old barrels and they would taste them and they were pretty darn good so they would purchase those barrels and uh, they'd bottle it and uh, that's where your, some of your 40 and 50 year old scotches, these bottles that were just averaging $5,000 a bottle would come from. And they were pouring one out there, emptying one bottle. And James said to Thomas, I believe James said that to Thomas, said, oh, my friend, this is the last drop. And they thought that would be a cool name for this mm -hmm. guy. Uh, so those two guys uh, created this company, and now their daughters are running it. Thomas has passed away, but James is still alive and kicking. Uh, it's really a, a wonderful story, a wonderful story, and it lends itself nicely to Buffalo Trace. Now let's take these pieces and start to put them together. We know that 50% of the taste profile of bourbon is the recipe, the grains, the yeast, okay? The other piece is the barrel. So one of the questions, one of the questions that one might ask is, if I have a really nice cool environment and I construct my barrel in such a way that I don't have a lot of the traditional leakage and uh, I use oak, from different parts of the world. What type of flavors could I actually extract from that wood based on its construction? So the analogy that I'll give you as we talk about this and we talk about what's going on here in, uh, in the cooler and in Warehouse P, what we've learned is a white oak tree is to bourbon, what a grapevine is to wine, what peat is to scotch. So we're learning where these trees grow. Uh, traditionally, it was 70 to 100 years. But now you're hearing more and more about these oak trees that are two and 300 years old uh, that, uh, that are being used to age bourbon in. So imagine the flavors that would be inherent in that wood. But as Harlan Wheatley says, in order to get them out, you've got to give Mother Nature and Father Time the opportunity to work their magic. And so our hope is that the cooler will provide us the opportunity to see what Mother Nature is actually going to create. The thing that I'm most excited about, guess what? The whiskey that's aging in that cooler, I will probably never live to taste in my lifetime. That is something for 40 to 50 years from now and hopefully they will appreciate what we're doing here at Buffalo Trace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. It's, you know, it's, it's trying to, uh, you know, use that to slow it down, like you said, and allow it to pull as much flavor as possible out of the wood and not just get overcharred and over oaked, but just slow it right down. I use, I use the example, uh, we were talking about uh, the front end of the piece, uh, fermentation. Uh, if you've ever seen your grandmother make yeast rolls, 
they put that yeast into the dough and knead it in and then wrap it in the cheesecloth and put it in a cool dark area and the yeast works very very slowly without a lot of heat and it produces exceptionally sweet buttery tasting rolls but if you've ever had a really good older aged bourbon or whiskey you get that same buttery kind of a mouthfeel and that's what we're excited about is we'll be able to extract those flavors without heat so traditionally when you char a barrel to get those caramelized sugars traditionally uh, there's seven different degrees of char well we use a number four char as our standard char but we're also playing with some other degrees of char but number four appears to do the most for capturing the flavors um, you get the color but the heat goes beyond the char and so it breaks down those sugars deep in the fibers of the wood and if you leave, leave it alone long enough, Mother Nature will extract those flavors out and it will become part of the taste profile of the product. So what we're finding is we're discovering things that the human body can taste, but the eye cannot see. Hmm. And that, that we, we've got some great questions on Facebook. Uh, if you want to answer a few of these, Brian Turner on Facebook says, and this, this reminds me of the char that you just talked about, does the level of char have an effect on the amount the climate has on the bourbon. So the difference, you know, does it block the climate? Does it, you know, depending on the char, does the char have an effect on the amount the climate affects the bourbon? The answer is yes. So you have to think about that. So if I wanted to produce a, a bourbon or whiskey um, really fast, what I would do is I'd give it a real heavy char, all right? Uh, I'd put it high in the warehouse and those dramatic changes in temperature fluctuations would move that whiskey in and out real quick. Okay, I'd get a whole lot of char, a lot of, a lot of heavy caramel notes, only one problem. When you do that, you compromise the integrity of the wood. So in that type of climate, that barrel is going to start leaking like a sieve. sieve. It's going to weep quite a bit with a real heavy char. If I give it a lighter char and I put it in the same environment, uh, that would be comparable to a Chardonnay wine. So you just a light toasting breaks down the sugars, but you don't get a lot of that pretty amber color. Um, so that's a compromise that you look at when you're doing your bourbons and your whiskeys. Based on my climate and the warehouse that I'm putting it in, what degree of char do I want for the taste profiles I'm trying to extract? Yeah, that's great. And uh, Jeremy Hine has a great question too. Is the goal, is the goal to slow the aging process or speed it up with the temperature controls? Well, there's two things. The first is um, there's very few people that's gonna to want to sit around and wait 50 years for their product. So, <laughs> so what, you, what you have is you have a balance. Uh, it's like if time was not a factor in our lives, we could produce 40 and 50 year old bourbons every day. But the reality is they're somewhat cost and time con you know, restrictive so the objective is, is to come up with products that are for today, a few for tomorrow, and a few for the future. So that's really the, the objective that you're looking for. Um, yes, slowing it down slows down the aging process, but then you have a lot of overhead and costs that you have to deal with if you want to produce that. But you have to have products that show this is what we can do today, and this is what we can do for tomorrow and we're looking ahead. Yeah, that's great. And I've noticed there's heaters in here and the windows are open. Uh, does that change throughout the seasons? Well, that's a good segue I mean, especially into, into the, win you know, yeah. the windows. So that's a good segue into the question we were just talking about, about the climate. So as we talked about earlier, we already know that at 45 degrees, the temperature the whiskey in the barrel goes dormant. Kentucky is known for 30, 20 to 30 degree temperature swings on any given day. That's in the summertime and in the wintertime. But in a winter month, we're going to close these windows. Mm -hmm. This is just for airflow to move the air around. Um, it creates an, a real nice environment so the barrels don't get too hot. But in the wintertime, we're going to close these windows. We're going to crank up the steam heat. And we're going to warm this area back up. We have barrels with thermometers in it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of maintain the atmosphere that these barrels are aging in on each level. That's great. I mean, we, 
we've got some great uh, temperature control questions here. Another one from Bob Teal on Facebook says, with the temperature control, do you have to rotate your barrels? Tell Bob, no. <laughs> so, Bob, actually, if we were a single product distillery, the answer to your question would be yes. We would have to rotate our barrels because, remember, the barrels on the top floor are going to be aging a lot faster than the ones down here. So, a single product distillery will rotate their barrels. But we make bourbon under 18 labels, so we basically know what the barrel is going to be when it grows up. So, we will place the barrels in the warehouse based on the interval of time that we want it to mature. Yeah, that's great because we don't... Uh, Buffalo Trace doesn't rotate any barrels outside of maybe experimentals or is... Yeah, so what you're going to do there is you know, we may change the climate um, basically like we were just talking about the, the barrels in the cooler. So the biggest portions of some of the barrels was in a traditional warehouse and then we moved them in there. The, the word of caution is remember the whiskey is saturating your char. And when you use like a number four char, which is a 55 second burn into the wood, when you start bumping that barrel and knocking it around, the weight of the whiskey in the char will actually cause it to flake off the sides of the barrel. And what you've actually done is changing the, change the aging characteristics of the whiskey in the barrel. So yeah, we try not to disturb the barrels. Yeah, that makes sense. We've got some other things uh, to see in here. We're, we're about 20 minutes Freddie, we try to keep these around 15 minutes. Well, that's Freddie, isn't it? Just poor <laughs> well, Freddie. Well, well when, I'm when, trying to, uh, you know, be considerate of your time. Well, we want, we know, we want to keep it to that because Harlan will beat me up. It'll be my last time to do an <laughs> uh, interview with you. <laughs> but we can just, uh, if you want, we'll just go down here and we can wrap up on this. Okay. Okay. So we, you know, speaking of barrels and aging, um, looks like. James Evans on Facebook has a great question too. How do you know a barrel has what it takes to be aged over 20 years? Is there anything when we're looking at barrels before we put whiskey in or historically we should know this barrel's good for 20 years? Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's, most people don't even understand the significance of the barrel. Um, Cooper in early European days actually meant a worker of wood. They were carpenters and cabinet makers and furniture makers. They understood the properties of different types of wood. And that's why there are multiple staves in a barrel that are all different sizes, is based on the expansion and contraction of the wood by having the pieces of wood different sizes, uh, it allows you to be able to leave the whiskey in the barrel for a longer period of time because the wood expands and contracts at different rates. But what we've also learned is the number of growth rings per inch will have a lot to do with that. And so the more, the more growth rings per inch that you have, the denser the wood, the longer you can leave your whiskey sit. Gotcha. So experience, that's how we know. Yep. So Freddie, we're about to wrap up. Um, I've got, I always have a lot of questions for you, but is there any last words or anything you'd like to say to folks before we close? Well, um, if they're as excited about Buffalo Trace as I am, they'll know that there's always something to come. So if we're talking about the cooler and uh, warehouse P today, they're going to be blown away with uh, an, a coming adventure with the Harlem and Warehouse X. Oh, that's true. So we're going to be talking about Warehouse X with Harlem pretty soon. Yep. And that'll take them to another level in what we're doing at Buffalo Trace. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Freddie, for your time. And always a pleasure, always a pleasure to hang out with you and ask questions. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, y'all come see us. <laughs>